Okay, well, I, my name is Renee Diane Whitehead. I, for the most part, I carve stone and uh, make things in three dimensions. What you see in my background is actually my studio as it now looks and uh, it changes from time to time. I make more stuff, sell more stuff. But this is actually the job of a lifetime for me. My whole life up to the point where I started sculpting, I was a uh, vice president of a company and we were selling that company and I was totally stressed out. And I was at some little grocery in San Francisco and they had one of these flyers that said, you know, come carve stone for a workshop. And I decided that would be really fun and good therapy. And I thought that hitting a rock with a hammer might be a really good thing to do right now, considering how stressed out I was. So I took that class and it was a revelation to me. It was like I had always done this. It's like I was home. It's like, wow, well, I can't believe it took me 50 years to find the path, <laughs> but here I am. Amazing. So this is my path, and uh, this and this is this gives me great pleasure to make mountains of dust, and to make beautiful objects, and to explore all these different things that are important to me. My sense of the natural world, my sense of the world, and related to how it is connected, uh, both historically and archaeologically and spiritually, and so I, I actually have found my way. A late bloomer, but I found my way. So I am, I've been uh, sculpting now for 20 years. And uh, unless my body prevents me from lifting heavy rocks at some point, uh, I will continue to do so. How do you do that? Do you have someone to help you sometimes to bring in the rocks or do you really do it all yourself? I have, I have uh, hydraulic lifts, I have a crane, and so I, um, I have afforded myself uh, the help I need because I work at odd hours and I don't work every day. And so this isn't, this isn't a, a corporate job. I left that. I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here I am. I am. The other thing I do, I do a little bit of glass. And uh, that's kind of uh, my, my arc to the future. If, I, if there are days that my hands don't want to uh, strike a stone with hammers, uh, I can go make stuff with glass. So it's all good. It's all fun. Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> so I am, uh, the teachers I had along the way were, um, first was Harriet Moore, who was the teacher who was running this class in San Francisco. She was, um, she was actually, she actually taught clay classes and stone classes, and she was really trying to teach people, people portraiture. I wasn't very interested in that, but that didn't matter. I just did what I did. And then after about a year or so studying with her, she told me that I had abstract tendencies. And so I, I thought, oh, I guess I do. And she says, you know, I want, you, I think you should study with somebody who is more likely to understand what you're going for, what your work is all about. And so she sent me to her friend, Pat Bankston Jones, and I studied with Pat at her studio for a couple of years. And that was, and Pat got it immediately. We talked, I showed her some pictures of stuff I'd already done. She goes, oh yeah, you'll fit right in here. So that was a great, that, she was a great teacher for me. And where, great, where was she located? Also in the area? She was in Berkeley. She was in Berkeley. Berkeley, yeah. And so I studied with her and then I, then I went to Pietro Santa to study sculpting in, in really the dust making capital of the world. This is where all kinds of artists go to make sculptures. Big sculptures get made for big projects and there's all kinds of workshops and it was sculpture heaven. And so I learned all sorts of things there and bought a lot of rocks. And so and that just, just was the very best. And so I am now um, now I'm in, now that we've moved to Sebastopol, uh, my studio is a big old barn that we have put some sheetrock up and more windows and some more lights and 
it's still a barn. It's still, you know, leaks and water comes in under the ground <laughs> and everything else. But it is the per it has great light and it has uh, and it means I can just walk up the hill and work, which is perfect. So I am more and more exploring uh, themes from my various travels. We got back from Cambodia to uh, see Angkor Wat. And it's amazing what has been carved, you know, centuries past, thousands of years past. It is, it is so enlightening and I have so much respect for those people because they, you know, every square inch of every building in Angkor Wat is carved. It is amazing. Not just one little carving, not just one wall. Oh no, every little thing. And I was just, I was just stunned every day for 24 hours a day, just whoa. <laughs> so it, so for me, it is encouraging to carry on a tradition of, uh, of a carving stone from deep within my soul. And because all these others have gone before me doing the very same. And I'm, so I'm, I'm just sort of carrying the torch forward, which, you know, and I, uh, I'm not sure what has happened to T. Barney. I have, I fear that he has had to escape the fires uh, up there by Healdsburg, but he too, uh, you know, carves from, you know, a place of flow. And so it's something uh, stone carvers share. You can't do this lightly. This is not, it's not, you just can't make a sketch and call it a piece of art. You make a sketch, you call it a sketch. You make a model, that's still a sketch. You make a sculpture, it may still be a sketch. You know, so it, it is something that takes time and energy and it takes a, a kind of intuition and attention every minute of every time you're sculpting. For one thing, you cannot be spaced out using big tools. That just is wrong. If you're feeling ungrounded, go work on your computer or something. <laughs> something that can't hurt you. <laughs> so, so there's a lot to know here. Yes. I have so many questions about that though. So first of all, my first question is, do you remember what the first stone was when you worked, the first time that you started? Was it like a soft stone or? It was alabaster. I still have the sculpture. <laughs> yeah, I wonder about that. It sits up on a special place in the studio. I think of it as the, the uh, spirit of the studio. Yes. And so, yeah, I, I know exactly which stone it is and I know where I bought it and it's still with me. It's just one of those, it's just, it's not for sale. <laughs> Next time I come to your studio, I definitely want to see that one. Yes, I, I'll show you that one. <laughs> yes. So, and when you talk about, okay, when you start, uh, first of all, you call them rocks. So you heard, you know my language. I mean, it's a rock, but I would say it's a stone, but you say it's a rock, right? Because it's a, rock, that it's a stone, yeah. It's a rougher than a rock, than a stone maybe, because it's like coming straight from nature. Okay, so, and you say, but you have, do you really start somewhere and then let it flow? Or do you have some idea depending on the rock or is it depending on the color or what, how, what happens exactly? I am, uh, I, I'm a person who plans. I am very determined. And so I do lots of drawing and then I make little, little uh, maquettes, which are little models of the drawings and to see if I like what it turns out to be three dimensions. When, and then I go from the three dimensions uh, of the little model, I, I kind of live with that and I decide whether or not it's worthy of time, energy and whatever to, to make it. The, and then I go to what I call the rock pile and I have this, this uh, accumulation of stones to carve. I've bought from various places and people give me presents. They, People bring me rocks because um, they know I do this. So I have this assortment and I, so I, I sort of take my model over there and, and imagine what it would be like if it was made of this stone or that stone. And then something will call me and then I will know that this, this image and this stone are going to be a sculpture. So out of the rock pile it comes with the help of one of my many machines and onto the table it goes and I, uh, then I use, there's a, there's a certain method of carving to get to your, to get to your shape and you sort of draw on the rock and you take the stone to that point and then you draw some more and you, it begins to, over time it begins to take the shape that you 
and then sometimes along the way, the shape that you thought you wanted it to be isn't exactly what it ends up, you end up wanting it to be. You know, what you first thought might change a little as things go by. And so I, I have changed, things have changed shape or changed slight directions or whatever in many of my sculptures, but that's part of the process. You know, because everything is actually a sketch. Yes. You sort of, this is a general idea. This is a better idea. This next idea is a more refined idea. And so you keep, this is, you know, this process of ever refining a concept or something that you're trying to accomplish is kind of true for everything everybody does, uh, unless you're somebody who just sketches and does no, no more than that. But almost, there's almost no artist that does only that. Almost all artists sketch, fuss around, think again, this and that, and then finally get to a place where the thing that they're making is the thing they want. Yes. So, and so that, to me, that process, actually it is that process that is the most valuable to, to the artists themselves. Yeah, the yes. act of us making stuff and, and finding our way every time we start to make something. It's, it's different every time. It's never the same ever, ever. Even if it seems like the same material, it's just not. It, you know, so every single thing you walk up to the learning curve and march up. Right. <laughs> so it's. Um, yeah, I, I understand that. Also, I think like, okay, I look at a rock, you know, and, I, and you think like, okay, well, it's, it's, it's lifeless. I say this, right, lifeless. But then I'm sure that you, when you, you start working on it, you discover those veins or those, those, those things that are typical to that place that you actually don't even see on the outside. And you work with that probably too, right? Everything informs the art that you make. Yes. And some of the rocks are very fracturable and you learn to work with that. Like with the calcite, the calcite has all these lines running through it and that's part of its beauty. And that it's refracted in that way, that it's formed in these sort of chunks of crystal crystallizations really and those those you can act when you're carving you can almost hear that something wants to give way and you stop huh. yeah <laughs> so that you have to be present present you know because it will break yes it yeah. will <laughs> i guess i guess i guess so, and all those, when I look behind you, there's, there are all these amazing colors, right? I mean, this is... <coughs> I love that, and I like that. I like, the, uh, I really am fond of trans, the translucence of some stones. And then there's <clears throat> other stones just have the most amazing sense of color. The one that's sort of, I guess, from where it's uh, right there, that, that, the dark one that's sort yeah. of standing there. That is actually um, something called Wonderstone, and it is actually purple and tan. So I was at a rock, one of the one of the places that sells raw stone, and, I, and I've known this guy forever. And I, I said, okay, so what's this one? He goes, oh, I knew you'd like this one. <laughs> so they already know. Wow. So I said, well, that one, you just have to put that one in my car now. I, um, more people are retiring and so a lot of the stone people that were local are gone so now I have to order my stuff through a guy in I think he's in Kentucky anyway so he he actually has us T Barney is part of this there's a few sculptors left out here and so he sends a postcard saying, somebody wants to order stone, do any of you want to, and we'll share the cost of shipping, which is great, you know. So, so I'll call him up and go, okay, I want something like this and something like that. And he goes, oh, I have something that he knows. <laughs> I have something you might like. And he shows me a picture of that. So it is um, because you are known and people know that you like this stuff, there, there's translucence and this and that and the other thing. So I have uh, a piece of... Um, Persian onyx, that sort of rosy lavender, which that may be next. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so there's all these great things that are available. It's amazing what's out there. 
Wow, because then first you have the rock, you have the color, you start to imagine things. And now you kind of just start beginning in your head, what am I going to do? Yeah, things start to percolate. And uh, one, of, uh, one of the other artists uh, that's part of the, the Savos is uh, Aaron Poovey. Yes. He, he, was, he did a lot of stone carving, now he's doing jewelry. But he's, he and I share this abject love of all of stones, every color possibility. So when he comes back from the, um, from the stone sales where he buys all of his gems, he says, oh, you have to come over and see this stuff. It's just, there's things here you haven't seen yet. You know? so, so we have this great love of, of the material yeah. before you ever do anything to it. You know? Sometimes it's just so beautiful the way it is. You have to wonder if you're doing it justice or if it was okay the way it was. <laughs> just, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I presume when you're a three-dimensional artist, there is always something about the material. I presume the same with clay, but definitely with, with sculpture, you know, stone mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I was thinking, okay, you showed me and you told me about the two teachers that you had, but in general, is there also a master? in sculpture that you think, wow, this is like the person, if only I could do that. Well, when you're sculpting in uh, Pietra Santa, it is Michelangelo, the master, and they speak of him as the master. Yeah. And for some reason, when you're there, you want to, you, you, you kind of want to carve really heroic, you know, out of scale pieces and stuff like that. But I'm really not an out of scale person. I'm kind of a small person. And so the out of, I've made a few of those pieces, but I, I'm not doing that anymore. You, if somebody right. really wants me to, I will. <laughs> I, I'm on my own, no more. But my, I, actually my real, uh, my first sort of, uh, my two that I have uh, sort of set the foundation for my work is, is Brancusi. And his work was very, uh, he, you know, he was sort of in the 20s and 30s and stuff. And he, his work was really about um, kind of the joy of form and the abstraction of form. He even made his own tools. It, you know, there's, there's his, they reconstructed his studio in Paris across from Georges Pompidou. And whenever I go to Paris, I always go to lose, it's sort of like, a, you know, I, I have to go and pray at the fount or something. <laughs> and Muzi <Yeah>. Brancusi, <laughs> must go. <laughs> so I go. But, uh, and the other one is, is Noguchi. And his sense of, his sense of the, abstra not just abstraction of form, but his sense of surface and his sense of, of uh, texture and what, and how he, his, he was really more zen about all of this. And, how the stone had its own sort of spirit and he kind of brought that to the fore. And so, and he's, the museum for him is in Queens. And so there's always this little side journey from New York to Queens <laughs> to see, Closer. To see um, his work. So, you know, and so there's as many others, of course, that I think are just marvelous, but those were the two, what my, my sort of, the, at the basis of much, uh, what I do, I think of them, and then there's all this this ancient stuff I've seen, you know, Egypt and Petra and so many places, and I and and, and stone and just the stone carvers of the world. You know, when you go to Peru and you see what they did there, you know, I walked over to this one giant piece of a wall that was just one stone, and it was just this beautiful, slightly curved surface with margins between the other stones that you couldn't even get your fingernail in. And I just stood there and, and, and put my face on the stone. And my husband is standing with the guy that, and the guy's going, what is she doing? He goes, she, she has to commune with the stones. <laughs> we can't really discuss it, but <laughs> that's how it is. <laughs> and it's so, not that you understand, right? You get yeah. it. So, you know, it's just one of those things. So here we are. I understand that. You have a relationship with that. I do. I, have, I, 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 I commune with stones. I'm guilty. Yes, so. no, I understand that. <laughs> so when I was a child, you know, I, I lived in Antwerp and there was a sculpture park. It's called um, Middleheim Park. Mm -hmm. And there is, a, there is a sculpture from Max Bill. 
you know, mm -hmm. the endless, the endless uh, circle. Or it's, um, as a child, you know, I think that is one of the reasons why I like art so much. In its simplicity, you know, the simple form and, you know, the whole, it was abstract, but it wasn't, you know. And, right. um, and I wonder um, how people, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, I came to your studio, I think, and whenever you have, uh, when you have a piece in the, mm -hmm. in the gallery, I love it. Because it's so, it's such an individual, it's such an individual in the gallery, you know, it's standing there. It's just, it is there, let's say it like that. But I wonder sometimes, do you also teach? Do you have people who follow you or who, uh, you know? I don't really teach. I had a few people ask. Yeah. And uh, I guess I could make myself be on a schedule and teach. <laughs> I'm sort of without a schedule. Um, and and I, uh, I certainly know enough to teach. I know a lot about the skill and the art and what and what you what you could consider to in order to I mean so maybe sometime I will. We'll see. Maybe you have an apprentice or someone. When, when I when I get old. Yeah, someone <laughs> someone who can just help you to move the pieces and check what you're doing and you know. Yeah, help right. You a bit when you don't want to be polishing. Or maybe that's part of the pleasure the polishing. I mean I might say that's maybe a task, but maybe that's the whole thing. Once you get to the finish. Um there's uh each each part of the process has its joys with the with sanding you can just uh, and all that the hand polishing just turn up the music and you know it's a meditation actually it's absolutely lovely to hear your love for it really lovely um i don't know if anyone uh, in our in who is there will have some questions elizabeth do you have some questions or natalie uh, or do you have any questions or she's i'm wait, i'm muting Okay, are you unmuted? There you are. Elizabeth. I was unmuting. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I missed it in the very beginning of your description of the rocks, but um, you're describing that you can see their color very well. But what is the surface like when you get it? Is it very rough or? Um, oh, the boulders? Yeah. Yeah, some of them are, are sort of rough and dirty. But if you uh, spray water on them, you can, you can and if they have, if they must have be a, yeah. <laughs> I usually keep a sprayer by the by my boulder collection. So when people come in, they can spray water on the rocks and see what color they really are. Because it's always such a, a, a surprise, especially at a giant red rock that is Persian travertine. And it just looks like an old dusty rock until you spray it. And it's this glorious reddish mm. pink color. And people are like, oh. <laughs> So, so you can kind of see that, and then plus, if the sun is shining through that window, and the, and there's translucence, it'll shine through the grid. You'll see it. Wow. You'll see it. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's a yeah. So the the boulder pile is uh, more important than you think. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating. It's really fascinating. Um, and on the one hand, because you're so good at it, it looks so easy now. You're like, oh yeah, you know, I start to think I have a sketch and then I start working and it will come by itself, etc. I think it must, I, it would really scare me to start something like that. But, but obviously. Yeah. It, um, it even scares me sometimes. I, <laughs> I know that uh, uh, it's uh, some, some philosopher said, uh, you know, uh, the only way to be fully alive is to do something that scares yourself every day. And and I, uh, and so there's always this moment before I start with a diamond saw to whack away pieces of the of the rock so I can get to the shape I want. Uh, there's just there's this moment that I I'm like okay so what are you doing? <laughs> is this rock going to take this kind of treatment or is it going to just crack in two? So I I do have uh, you know apprehensions from time to time yeah but that doesn't stop me <laughs> just i just <laughs> <have> breathe <laughs> obviously not and look at the beauty that's behind you it's so beautiful right just from here by looking at the work that's in your studio so you open your studio to the public i do and i people people sometimes show up with a ratty old catalog from one of our open studios. 
and and then they'll point to my, the picture. So you still have that? Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> but I have other stuff, and I always have a lot of stuff, and sometimes something that's similar, or you know. But the other thing is is that people get used because I've been doing this whole thing for so long. Uh, and we've been out here for 14 years, and I've been part of the open studios for probably 12 or something. So it, um, so people are used to kind of know I'm here, and sometimes they just drive up, and I'm working away, and I'll look up, and there's somebody there. It's like, oh. And so, uh, you know, so sometimes I get surprise visits. Mostly people call ahead. And then, of course, they expect that I'll be open for the open studios, and hopefully next year this happens. For yeah. Us. And this year by appointment, you know, they can make an appointment with you. Or I you also have decided to be open the last two weekends. Oh, the last two weekends, that's good to know. Right. I, um, I, there's, uh, life is busy, and this isn't the only thing I do, but I, so I am uh, T. Barney. <laughs> Hi. What happened? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so I'm uh, going to be open the last two weekends. Hopefully it won't be so hot. Right. Yeah, hopefully we're all still there. Yeah. And uh, he was there. Yeah, he was and, uh, and T. Barney, where is he now? And he's, he's I put my face mask on. <laughs> <laughs> we were hoping you'd still be there, that you didn't have to evacuate. I'm sorry, we had a collector here, and he stayed a lot longer than I thought, but um, it's okay. It's a good thing. Hi. Hello, Hello. everybody. I don't know if many people are here or what, but um, uh, what are we doing? Well, <laughs> yeah, maybe it's better without the shield now. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, maybe I'll finish with Renee. We have almost done, but you know, where is your studio exactly? Where you, you want to repeat, uh, tell us again where your studio is, despite the fact that everybody knows where it is. Can you okay. tell us again? Well, my studio is on Bloomfield Road, 3520 Bloomfield Road, between okay. Blucher Valley and Burnside. So. Thank you. Well, Renee, maybe you have a question for T. Barney. <laughs> hey, hey there. <laughs> nice to see hey you there. again. Yeah. I'm so glad that, that you're not evacuated. <laughs> Me too. I'm I worried about you. I saw, I got this huge blast of emergency stuff on my cell phone. I went, uh oh. Yeah. Yeah. Nixel alerts are good. No, we're good. Hi, I'm T. Barney. I don't know how many people are here, but I've uh, been a professional sculptor for 40 years. Um, I carve stone uh, abstract for the most part, and I do bronze limited editions from those stone sculptures that I've carved. Um, I make uh, a lot of Mobius strip like sculptures and um, I've carved 211 different kinds of stone from I think it's 56 countries now. Um, I'm hoping to get a block of this weird stone from Greenland because I'm pretty sure nobody else has ever carved it. Um, Bennett, you'll have to come out and see me on the uh, 18th and 19th of this month where we will be open for live viewing in the sculpture garden and in the gallery, social distancing and masking. So um, which, which day is that, T, Barney? When, which day is that? Saturday and Sunday, the 18th, uh, so, sorry, the 19th and 20th. Yeah. Okay. There was a question, there's a question that I forgot to ask also, Renee, but you know, you talked, when you talked about the, the stone from Greenland, I thought about that, but some stones are toxic, right? Some stones are, they have uh, some, when you have the dust, when you breathe, I mean, all dust is not good to breathe, but some stones are particularly not good for the health. Is that so, or is that just an idea I had? Oh, some forms of, of soapstone can have a kind of native asbestos, and some stones can have other stuff, but, you know, you're supposed to suit up. Hello? <laughs> yeah. The bug. We, we were, we, we, we look, we we look, look like Darth really, Vader most of the time. Yeah, we look like, it's very glamorous. You know, there's the goggles, there's the bug, you know, there's gloves. You know, it, it, it behooves you to take care of your health. You, <laughs> well, and so stone sculpture is kind of unique in that you, um, it's subtractive. Almost all other types of art are additive. I mean, even the bronzes come from uh, clay or 
plastiline maquette, and that's all additive. Mm -hmm. And stone sculpture, we take away, and you can't really work stone with your bare hands. So we need tools, and we use lots of different tools, hammer and chisel mm -hmm. and diamond blades and diamond sandpaper and lots of tools to take material off of a big block that we start. And so one, the, the tools, the power tools make a lot of noise. So we have to wear earmuffs and a lot of the stones are <laughs> the dust that we make because basically that's what we do is we make dust we, so we have to wear a respirator and goggles and a weightlifting belt and gloves. So we're, we're kind of like Darth Vader. Um, <laughs> at least that's how we look. And it's always fun when my wife wants to get my attention because I'm, you know, I'm sitting here grinding into something and I'm not seeing anything around me because there's dust flowing. So she's gotten into the habit of sh throwing pebbles at me to get my attention. Which isn't always great because I have a very powerful diamond saw going and it will cut through skin, bone, you name it. And so she tries to just hit me in the legs as opposed to throwing the pebble at my head. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know you very well, T. Barney. I still have to come to your studio, but I have to tell you, you're definitely the best entertainer of all the artists that I know, ever. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, but see, Renee's prettier. <laughs> well, I can't say anything about that, all right? That is, that is a tricky, that's a tricky, that's tricky what you're saying there. <laughs> so, um, what about, Ibarne, we, what Renee talked about as well is about her first teacher, you know, how she got into, into sculpting, and after that also, who is her biggest inspiration? Or, you know, who, who is, well, Renee's my biggest inspiration now, but before that was Brancusi and Jean Arp and um, any of, uh, you know, I started making really strange sandcastles as a child at the beach. And uh, so that was my formation of working with my hands and wanting to make something physical. I did study painting and architecture and lots of other art forms. I went to Rhode Island School of Design um, and uh, actually started uh, painting figuratively and sculpting figuratively because that's what they taught. And as soon as I could get away from carving the figure, painting, drawing the figure, I left as, as because what I like to think of is my abstract pieces are something you might discover in a dream and I'm not trying to bring life into an inanimate object that looks like a person or an anthropomorphic form. Um, what was the other part of the question? <laughs> so uh, uh, how, where did you get your, where did you learn, where did you learn, the, 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 where, where was your, how was your schooling and also who is your inspiration? You know? Ah, um, Rhode Island School of Design among other places, um, uh, Denison University, Ohio State, Stanford University, but I got a, a BFA in a, um, from Rhode Island School of Design. My inspiration um, comes from uh, the Mobius strip and August Mobius. He, uh, I learned this in the second grade where you take a, a strip of paper and you make a tube out of it and then you give it one twist and all of a sudden it has one edge and one surface and I'm still making those <laughs> from the second grade. So I've been making them for 50 years. Yeah. Um, this year I'm celebrating my 40th year of being a professional sculptor. The sad whining part is we had events planned every month. I had a a, a collector's lunch for 40 collectors here in April and then different galleries around the country. We were having openings and different events and of course that all went by the wayside. So I'm grateful that to Tanae and Eve and you and everybody for bringing this virtual event to, together. Um, yes, because I was going to be on Art at the Source and now you know, Art Trails. So yeah. we're here. We're here. 
right you know, and um, it's been very successful so far. So, um, you know, we want to continue that. Oh, yeah, do you want to show us your studio a little bit? I know you're taking a drink. That's also uh, good. Yes, I think to be big screen, I have to keep talking. So this is my gallery here um, with a couple of pieces. And maybe you can see through the windows, there is a sculpture garden. Um, and then this is my gallery here. And it, you know, we also use it as a dining room sometimes. Um, <laughs> but it has, it has lots of windows. Um, and one of my painter friends said, I'll never show with you because you, you don't have any wall space. I just have lots of natural light. Um, and let's see, we can, we can look at this piece here. I think it's here. I don't know if you can see this, but this is what's fun. And Rene knows this too. Turning the sculpture is part of the touch. Uh, and that's what people ask what T stands for and T Barney and it, it's touchable. Oh my gosh, finally, a mystery solved. <laughs> Any other questions? So I, I mentioned this to Rene, but and neither you or Rene have been mentioning him. Max Bill, you know? Max Bill, the sculpture, is a similar shape, yeah. you know, what has been yeah. very influential on my whole thinking about sculpture. And uh, oh. I never heard anyone mentioning him. He's American, though. He is American, and I, I should use him as an, as an influencer um, because my first trip to Carrara, Italy, where I get some of my stone, he was actually there working on a huge trefoil Mobius. I mean, this thing had to be like 30 tons. I mean, it was like 10 feet tall by 10 feet by 10 feet, and, and they had to stop traffic to get it to the SDF studio to work on. And um, I saw this as I was driving around, I saw this on the big, this big truck with all of the traffic stopped. So I just followed them all the way to the studio <laughs> to find out what the hell was going on here. So yes, you, I, should, I should mention Max Bill. Well, you, do, you don't have to, but I was just surprised. Oh, thank you for reminding me. So uh, Rene mentioned that you together, you buy your rocks, you know, you have it put in a container and you then get pay the shipping together. So what, since I haven't asked that question to Rene, but what is your favorite stone to work with? What is the favorite stone? And or what has been your favorite stone in all the time or what will be, you know, what, are, what is kind of the idea about the rock? Um, it's probably the stone I'm working on now. Right. <laughs> yeah. I guess you were going to say that. <laughs> you fall in love all over again. <laughs> you know, I could, you know, I could have known that, right? <laughs> I tend to, uh, I mean, I, I work anything. I 211 and I actually have, I think I have 18 more pieces of rock here that I want to work on eventually that I haven't worked on. But I tend to like translucent stones. And I don't know if you can see this, but this is a piece of Utah calcite. And that's, Renee also works in this. Um, I like when the stone can grab the natural light and, and, um, and just shine, um, but I'll work, you know, I'll work any kind of stone once. Um, and we, yes, we have stone uh, pushers out there like Miles Schachter and, and others that uh, get, carving stone blocks for us and then we buy them from them yeah and they know what we like and so when a shipment yeah. is coming up uh miles will tempt me with little jpegs on the computer yep yes exactly <laughs> don't you want one of these blocks one? too <laughs> so but then and don't you fight ever about one like oh my gosh i wish i had had that one you know and not t barney or that no you're fine there's always more <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's always there's always more in the mountains. Yeah. Do you um, work Do you work one at a time, or do you sometimes work several? I mean, I would guess for an it's one at a time, but I don't know. I'm just saying that sometimes it's two or three. You know, right now I'm finishing okay. one, starting another, and dreaming about a different one. You know, I'm just fickle. I, what can I say? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I have about 150, maybe 200 tons of stone here. 
at my studio in the corporation yard. And so um, I will uh, hopefully have a commission. So I'll work on that because that means there's going to be some money coming in. But it's, I look at the blocks for years sometimes and figure out what it wants to be and what needs to be taken away. And if on that particular day, I want to start on that, that's what I do. So I probably have 12 pieces going in some form. And uh, there's a choreography of tools, if you will, because you know we're starting with a square block of stone that's heavy. And uh, there's, there's roughing out where you're really banging on the stone and taking a lot of material off. And then you go to a finer tool and take a little bit off at a time, because if you take too much stone off at a time, you can't put it back. And that's always difficult um, to uh, realize, oops, <laughs> that went a little too thin. Yeah. Uh, but I take my sculptures pretty thin. I don't really have anything I can lift up and show you, but um, I'm not sure there's more that can be taken away from a lot of my sculptures. And also when you start with a block that weighs say 600 pounds, I want to be able to lift it when it's done. So I have to take a lot of material off until it's about 150 pounds or less because that's all I can really lift now. Um, one of my COVID pieces I don't know if you can really see this. We got but it. This is, this is my COVID era pieces. This is a very expensive, the most expensive marble paper or marble toilet roll. I guess. <laughs> and I went figurative. Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> did. You did. You did. I'm going to call it that. Yeah. But you also, it's also the most efficient because, you know, you don't really take too many pages out of it. So. You have it for a very long time, that toilet roll paper. Yes, it's, it's pretty much there forever. Yeah. Oh yeah, now we did a whole bunch of research on what people use before toilet paper. And so we have little statements that go with these rolls that I'm making that uh, talk about the different ways people used to clean up uh. before bidets or before toilet paper. Um, what was something else? Oh. My last figurative piece was at Rhode Island School of Design. Well, actually, that's not true, but my, my first, what I considered a big commission was to do a almost full-sized eagle out of alabaster, Colorado alabaster, and it had about a four foot wingspan. And so I got this block from Colorado. I carved it all by hand because back then we couldn't use any power tools and I was carved the wing that was sailing in the body and the rest of the wing and that it was coming off of a mount. And as I was banging on the lower part, the wing fell off. <gasps> and I was devastated. And I talked to the commissioner and then I said, look, it, the wing fell off. I don't know what to do. And he said, well, I'm not gonna give you any more money, but I would still like it. So I ordered another block. And I snuck power tools into the studio uh, because that was gentler and faster to make it. And it was coming to the end of the semester and I was going to get kicked out of the studio. And I made it in uh, two weeks. I finished the piece in two weeks where it had taken me a whole, uh, you know, half or semester to hand carve this piece. And that's one of the things about using power tools is a hammer and a chisel. This is a big bang and that's really for roughing out. And so using these power tools allows us a lot more freedom to uh, stretch the stone, if you will, than yeah. what you can do with a hammer and a chisel. Yeah. And, and also some stones just won't take the, uh, won't take the vibration of hitting it with a hammer. You can What's use an button? air, you can use an air hammer and turn it down so that the, the vibration is pretty low and you can you can gently sort of get material to be moved off without disturbing the structure of the stone. But you just have to listen because the stone will start to kind of tell you that perhaps this is a bad idea. And so then, then there's the gazillions of grinding possibilities, which we both own 
uh, little moving trucks full. And so, <laughs> wow. and it's full. you know, like a Picasso said, you know, critics talk about art, artists talk about tools. <laughs> well, sculptors talk about power. Tools. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really good slogan, you know. Yeah. I'm going to use that in my post. Yeah. Um, one of my, just what Renee was saying, um, I used to teach at different places, and this is at the uh, uh, Central California Carving or Sculpture Symposium down in Cambria. And one of my students really wanted to work this Utah cow site, which I just showed you an example of, and you can see some behind Renee. And she didn't want to use power tools. She wanted to carve it all by hand. And I even loaned her my little air hammer and she tried it and she didn't like the vibration. So she just carved it, kept carving at it with a hammer. And it wasn't even a very big hammer. And yes, about part of the way through, the piece broke in half and she was devastated. Wow. You just can't always use, you know, you have to have a multiple. You have to listen. Tool. Yeah. You have to listen. Yeah. And, and, and look. Yeah. And here's here's the big secret that I always uh, charge more for is when you're carving something soft that doesn't ring like the calcite or even most of the alabasters or soapstones, mm -hmm. is you mix some food coloring with water and you spray it over the whole block and then wipe it back and the food coloring will seep into any of the really big cracks right. in the stone and you want to take those away before you start designing what you want to have come out of that stone because otherwise you're going to end up with two pieces. And, and there's no carver alive that hasn't ended up with two pieces. <laughs> or four. Or four. <laughs> It's happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's just, and then you then you just you say in principle things. You leave the studio. You take a small walk. <laughs> right. Well, that's usually when I go and carve a piece of wood. <laughs> I I go back to the house, make myself a cup of tea, and and mumble to myself. <laughs> I have this question. So with Charlotte, you're going to come out. Uh, I mean, sorry, Catherine. Yeah. You're no, going to come out on the 19th and 20th, right? 11 yeah, to 4. I can come uh, the 18th or 20th. Well, that's next week, right? 19th, oh, sorry, 19th or 20th. 19th or 20th. I'm I better sure write it down. 19th or 20th. I will come down. Yeah. Or just look at any of my social media postings. I'm sure it will be all over that. We also did post this morning all about this so hopefully lots of people are tuning in from all over the country um, well, but it doesn't really matter because this gets recorded so it can be shown at any time okay. so that's the okay. good part because, we'll get uh, to this. you'll get cool. a link to this so i have one one little question still what do you do with all the bits that you take off where do they go well what I do is I have, especially the pretty bits, you know, the orange ones and the pink ones yeah. and all that. I actually have a pile in the in a corner of the studio for the rock hound. And it's like party favors. I say, you know, you guys who have pebbles in your pockets, you know who you are. You go on back there and you uh, take take the, the ones you like. You like the yellow ones, you like the orange ones, the pink ones, you know. Don't worry, I won't run out. I'm always making more. So they, they actually, the, the, the pocket pebble people, and sometimes they have kids at home and they'll take some for the kids. You know, they're just like little shards of rock. Yeah. Yeah. And I love it. <laughs> shards of rock. One of the things that uh, we've been doing for a while is when I get a new stone and I don't, I haven't ever worked it and I, I you know, I kind of know what marble does and stuff, but each different kind of stone is, uh, works differently. So um, we actually take the block and we cut a piece off. I don't know if you can see this. This is yeah. Bolivian sodalite. Um, and this is a uh, art, another Argentine onyx mm -hmm. that you can see. We yeah. cut a piece off and polish it and work it a little bit to see how it, you know, what it can do and to see the nice pretty colors in it and and how we might uh, shape it to uh, accent those colors. 
and the rest of this stuff is basically um, paving my driveway, uh, except a uh, couple times a year, the local Alexander Valley School uh, art class comes over and the kids get to go in the, the dump pile and take pieces of rock home. And uh, we sort of show them how to work it. Uh, and the parents are always like, oh, great. My kid just came home with, uh, you know, their pockets full of T. Barney <laughs> rubble. It's full of pebbles. Very nice, you know, very nice. We like to call it T. Barney rubble because that's part of the Flintstones and, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a stone yeah. sculptor. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, Barney. <laughs> Well, I, unless uh, maybe, uh, I don't know who is here, if they have any questions or um, if there is anything more that you want to say, but um, do you have any questions? Anything, anyone wants to put something in chat if it's needed or uh, T. Barney, if you want to say anything still or uh, Renee, now is the chance. Oh, well, look. <laughs> yeah, can you see this piece? Yes. I don't yeah, think yeah. I have light. But this is called Picasso marble. Right. And I have a quick story on it, which goes like this. Um, it, it looks like some modern painter painted the stone, right? Because it's got yeah. all these different figures in the stone. Well, it was discovered by a, a guy named David Penny, who was a prospector, and he was actually looking for evidence of mineral, uh, expensive minerals like silver, gold, or whatever. And he took a sample down and had it tested and they said, well, this is a unique form of marble. What do you want to call it? And he said, well, it looks like some modern painter painted it. So let's call it Picasso. Well, if you know anything about Picasso's work, he didn't paint like that. This would be more a Jackson Pollock marble than right. it would be a Picasso marble. Yes. Oh, well. They That's my story. Picasso, but we will remember the name now. Hey, I wanted to tell you that we actually could share actually the pieces I prepared that we could see your pieces on there. Let's see. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Let me see that I have this. I want to show. Well, first we'll go to yours. And um, okay. so. Look who do we have there? So that's. Hey. Uh, yeah, that's your work that I can show here now. And uh, that yeah. the one that you put on there on Savos, you see the incredible differences in color as well. Well, some of those are bronzes, but my bronzes come from pieces I've actually carved and then we scan them or mold of them and then cast the bronze, which to me gives the bronze a little more integrity because it came from a real sculpture as opposed to a maquette made of plaster or plastiline or clay. Um, it, the, the bronzes come from a sculpture I actually carved. Okay, this is on the left is a bronze as well. And yes. then we the mm -hmm. onyx chain of connected ideas. That's a bronze. And the next jade colored one is a bronze and then the rest are stone. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Oh, I'll show also what the top piece is, the one, the first one. It's incredible. Chinese flora. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. And so let's go to Renee's work. Yay. <laughs> Doesn't always work that small, obviously. And here is her work. These are medium sized pieces. Uh, you know, 24 inches, 18 inches, you know, so these are tabletop pieces. Uh, like T. Barney, I am uh, interested in work that I can carry without uh, destroying a, a back that is in very good condition for all of the damage and crazy stuff I've done in my life. <laughs> I'm still walking and I'm still straight and uh, tall. So I, um, I am interested in work that I can carry and work that uh, doesn't hurt me. So anything, but I'm not like T. Barney. I'm a much smaller person than he is. And so uh, for me, anything more than 70 pounds becomes a problem. I can lift 70. I'm Still an awful lot. A lot of these rocks start at more than, my rocks are bigger than myself. They weigh more than I do. You know, so, you know, that's why I have hydraulic lifts, cranes, and other stuff to help me. 
incredible, incredible. Well, I, I really enjoyed talking to you and uh, I learned a lot as well. I hope it will be forever the same. I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, actually for T. Barney, I, I'm interested in the process of translating a stone sculpture into uh, metal. Uh, what is the process? You must have to make some kind of form. Well, um, it depends on how simple the form is, um, but you can actually, I, I, made, I made the molds directly from the stone piece. In other words, a, a uh, silicon rubber mold that actually comes oh. apart. Okay. And then you put the, that mold back together and pour wax into that mold and then take that wax mold off and then yeah. that wax is surrounded with ceramic shell or a refractory material that can withstand high heat. Now you have a uh, casting mold and that mold goes into an oven, the wax melts out and then you pour your hot aluminum or your bronze into that cavity where the wax was. It's called the lost Wax I know, method. lost wax process. You, you've heard of that, right? Yes. Well, if you see this wax, let me know. I feel bad because, you know, it's, it's lost. <laughs> That's a boundary joke. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Did that help? The, the other, the newer yes. technology now, which I'm using for some, uh, you know, like a piece like, like this one, uh, nobody wants to make a mold of this and guarantee that it's not going to damage the stone. Right. So in that case, I would actually have that sculpture scanned. Mm -hmm. And that scan gives me a 3D database that then we can actually print something that is castable. Um, you print it in a polymer that can be melted out with hot bronze. That gives you a bronze. It doesn't give you the mold to make more of them you finish that bronze and then make a mold of that bronze and that gives you uh, the ability to do limited edition of the bronzes. Excellent. Did that answer your question? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, Okay. very interesting, thank you. Thank you very much. Again, I'll be open on the 19th and 20th from 11 to four. I'm at 4370 Pine Flat Road outside of Hillsburg near Jimtown in Alexander Valley. Um, come out and taste wine. We will have some wine here and some snacks and stuff. Well, and we will be practicing safe um, COVID uh, what masks and distancing. And we have lots of hand cleaner. And so everybody that comes out always has a good time. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, T. Barney. Thank you so much, Renee. It was a real pleasure and a real honor talking to you and to have the time to do that as well and to listen to you, to your stories. It was really, really great. Thank you very much. Success with the Open Studio. And we'll see each other soon. I'll see you on the 19th or the 20th. Thank you. Bye, bye T. Barney. Bye-bye. Bye, Renee. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye, nice everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>